Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is a college admissions panel discussion and Q&A, and we have Northeastern University, Trinity College, and Binghamton University here with us this evening. We are so excited to welcome them, and we're hoping that this will be a really you know, informative and helpful discussion about college admissions, especially thinking about this kind of strange year that we're all in and what to expect for fall admissions uh, this upcoming cycle. So we encourage you guys to use the chat box and the Q&A box throughout the webinar this evening. Um, we're going to start off with introductions. And so if you each just want to introduce yourself, um, Evan, we'll start with you and we can just go to Courtney and then Craig. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Lane. I am an assistant director of admissions at Northeastern University, and I've been here in Boston with Northeastern for about four years now. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Roach. I'm a Senior Assistant Director of Admissions at Trinity College. Um, I'm also an alum of Trinity College, graduated in 2016. Uh, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Hello everybody, I'm Craig Broccoli with Binghamton University. I'm based in New York City for Binghamton these days. I live in the Bronx right now. I did go to Binghamton not that long ago, um, but this is year nine in admissions for me. Awesome. So just a little agenda for this evening. We're going to start off with a preview, um, just an overview of every school. So we'll start with Evan and then go on to Trinity and Binghamton. And then we're going to leave a lot of time this evening for Q&A. We received a lot of questions prior to the webinar this evening. And then, like I said, we'll also be taking questions live. So throughout the presentation, feel free to use that Q&A box and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. So Evan, you want to kick it off? Sure thing. Yeah, it's my it's really my pleasure to introduce Northeastern to all of you joining us tonight. Um, uh, we have a fairly significant presence in the in the Middle Atlantic region. New England is really our bread and butter, and it's been uh, a lot of fun getting to know uh, New York City, New York State uh, over the course of the last couple of years. I recruit in the outer boroughs in Lower Manhattan mainly, but I've been doing things uh, with different organizations and schools and and whatnot, uh, and it's been a uh, pleasure learning about you all, and now I wanna introduce Northeastern to you. We are a private, medium-sized, tier one research university that is right in the middle of the city of Boston, and I say medium-sized because uh, we're not quite, uh, I, I say we're right in the middle of being medium-sized, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the medium category range is very widely when describing colleges and universities, so we're not, Ohio State with you know upwards of 40,000 students that were not a smaller liberal arts college. Uh, we have about 18,000 undergraduate students across all academic years and we have representation from just about all 50 states. Usually one of the Dakotas will slip through our fingers. Uh, and on the flip side from uh, domestic student representation, we have a very robust international student presence on campus as well. It's actually just under 20% of all of our undergraduate students that uh, hail from some country outside the United States, about 120 different sovereign nations are represented on our campus. Uh, I mentioned I recruit in New York City, but I also am responsible for traveling around and recruiting in South America and East Africa as well. So uh, it's, it's a, a blast truly to participate in uh, fostering a culture of diversity on campus, ranging from racial and ethnic, but also geographic geography, demography, uh, perspective, and, and all of those warm and fuzzies. But I really want to emphasize in the couple minutes I have tonight, the, the facets of Northeastern that really set it apart from a more traditional college and university. And uh, there's a little algebraic formula on the next slide here that I want to emphasize. And this is uh, our suite of experiential learning opportunities. Yep, this one right here. Um, with this, uh, I'm not exactly sure what this young woman is doing, but it strikes me as some sort of research. Uh, so experiential learning is really learning by doing, right? So it, it's not traditional learning in the classroom, though we have a very strong academic experience in the traditional sense. Uh, we put our money where our mouth is when we say we value experiential learning and we say, all right, you have to do at least one of these four things that you see on this screen before you in order to graduate. It's a lot easier to do than it might sound and many students do multiple things they might mix and match a lot of these four things overlap in many ways but to just quickly rattle through them of course 
Global study is the one that you might be most familiar with, study abroad in some form for an academic semester. We also have short mini study abroads over the course of summer terms. We call them dialogues of civilization. Service learning uh, takes place in and out of the classroom. So you might sign up for a service learning course where you are learning to program in the Cory College of Computer Science, but then to pass the class with a good grade, you have to actually take that skill and uh, flex it, so to speak, with a local community partner. Uh, I mentioned we're a tier one research university. Uh, that just means we have the highest level of research being conducted on and around our campus. And there are opportunities for undergrads right from your first semester if you wanna hit the ground running in that way. And there are plenty of opportunities uh, to, be, to be paid for that labor as well. But the most important form of experiential learning at Northeastern that I really want to emphasize and make sure you uh, come away knowing about is our co-op program. Uh, a lot of you might be interested in internships when you go off to college, or, and you might even be doing some internship work now in high school. Uh, but we say, all right, an internship is great, but what if we could make it even better? And uh, at Northeastern, a co-op is a period of six months of full-time work. You are not going to class. You're not earning credit. You're very importantly not paying tuition. If any parents are on this call right now, they may be freaking their ears up at that. But for that period of six months, a student's full-time job is to go and take what they're learning or had learned in the classroom and apply it in a real world setting that uh, really applies that knowledge and puts it into action. And once folks hit that six month mark and come back to the classroom, they're conversations that they're having with their faculty members and their peers and their colleagues in class are that much more enriched because they have seen it firsthand. Students can do one co-op, two co-ops, or even three co-ops and gain a year and a half of full-time work experience by the time they graduate. Uh, I have to say, co-op is technically optional. The only requirement, hard and fast, is to do one of these four forms of experiential learning. Co-op is certainly the most popular and uh, the most unique and I, I believe it really drives the strongest results for our students or I should say our students are driving strong results for themselves based on the experiences they're accumulating over the course of co-op. All of these jobs are just for our students at organizations over 3,000 different companies worldwide that are just for our Northeastern Huskies. You don't have to compete against every other college kid to go and get a period of co-op under your belt. And of all students that do at least one co-op, over half of them receive a full-time job offer from one of those places they invested six months of their time, energy, blood, sweat, tears into. So uh, we really are very proud of our students and we're seeing tangible uh, professional development results in that regard. And just to put a pin in uh, painting this Northeastern picture for you on the next page. Uh, of the three universities and colleges you're hearing about today, we are the only one in Boston. In my humble opinion, it is the ultimate college town. Uh, Massachusetts itself has a very strong tradition for higher education and in the greater Boston area itself, there are over a quarter million college students that flood the city uh, under typical public health circumstances in the fall semester, dropping the average age down to something crazy like 26 or 27. So it really is a college student's town. Even within just a 10 minute walk of our campus that is sort of half traditional green campus and half urban campus with subways, you can meet college students from about a dozen other colleges and universities. Boston is of course also a, a hotbed, a hotbed, excuse me, for culture, innovation, technology, pharmaceuticals, etc. So there's lots to do by way of co-op and just having a good time and in typical fashion. I have talked just so, so long, uh, but it's great to be with you all tonight. I look forward to answering some of your questions uh, alongside my friends here. And we can talk about virtual campus visits and contact information a little bit later on. Thanks, y'all. Awesome, Evan, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it over to Courtney now, talk about Trinity. 
Awesome. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm excited to answer some of your questions and engage with you on and offline. Um, for those who might not be familiar with Trinity, I've included the fun little colored map here to give you a sense of just where we are. Um, we're located in Hartford, Connecticut, which is just about two hours from New York City, but also two hours from Boston. Um, so it's kind of smack in between two major cities. And I'll talk a little bit about Hartford in a bit. But I did want to share just a couple of facts and figures about Trinity. Uh, we are a small liberal arts private institution, and I share these numbers here about our population and the number of students per class and the student-faculty ratio because I think it really does give students a sense of what we're really all about at Trinity. Um, it's a very individualized experience, especially as a small liberal arts institution. Um, Trinity is not the place where you're going to feel lost or you're going to feel like just one of many students in the classroom. It really is a place where people, uh, whether that's faculty, staff, or other students are really going to be invested in you in your overall experience at Trinity. A um, couple things to note that I want to share at this at a glance slide. Um, one, we have a pretty small undergraduate population of just over 2,000 students. We do have a few graduate programs limited to about five different programs, so we really do focus on the undergraduate experience at Trinity. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is about um, our number of majors and minors. For a school of our size, it's pretty rare to have 41 different majors and 28 different different minors. Um, I think there's often a misconception when people hear liberal arts that they assume that means just the performing arts or it means the studio arts when in reality liberal arts actually stands for and is short for liberal arts and science colleges. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about some of our STEM programs moving forward. Uh, but this is again just a brief overview. Okay, um, so there are three things that I'm going to talk about today that I think if you remember nothing else about Trinity, it's these three points that I think really set us apart. Um, and the first is that liberal arts and innovation. Um, at Trinity, we really are invested in the academic exploration part of your undergraduate experience. We find it hard to believe that many 17 and 18 year olds when they're starting their college journey have a really clear and set idea of what they want to want to do with their future. And so your first year at Trinity is really dedicated to finding your academic path and finding what your passions are and how to relate that into an academic department. Um, we've had students who take advantage of upwards or 10 or 13 different departments before they actually declare their major by the end of the sophomore year. Um, and so we really do encourage our students, no matter what they might be interested in, to come in with a flexible or at least undecided mindset so that you have an opportunity to take advantage of courses that you might never have had experience to in your high school or secondary education um, experience. Um, we do have a first year seminar or gateway programs. These are essentially kind of like intro to academics at Trinity. Um, we don't necessarily have required courses at Trinity. We have that first year seminar program that will essentially give you the reading, um, writing, and analytical skills that we think is important for you to succeed in a Trinity classroom. Um, the professor of that class will also be your academic advisor until you're able to declare your first year, your major at the end of your second year. Um, a couple of the majors that I wanted to highlight, um, human rights. We're actually one of the first colleges in the country to offer a human rights program um, in addition to a human rights program. This is one of my favorite departments. If I could go back and redo my undergraduate experience, I 100% would have majored in human rights. Um, it's one of, I think, the most interdisciplinary programs that we have to offer. Um, oftentimes in a human rights course, you're going to be sitting with students. Um, maybe it's a class of 18 students and you'll have almost 18 different departments represented. Presented. Um, you'll find that students are coming in from a variety of different backgrounds academically to learn about how what they're learning in engineering or neuroscience or public policy and law all relates back to the human experience. Um, I'll also highlight our neuroscience program because it's one of my favorites. We actually offer a five years bachelor and master's degree program within neuroscience. It's currently our fastest growing major, um, partly because our president, um, who is in her sixth year at Trinity, is actually has her uh, doctorate in neurotoxicology. And so she brought a lot of excitement and energy and resources back into that department. It's great for the students who maybe are thinking about um, psychology, but taking it to the next level. And how do you really take that into um, a more physical sense. So that's one of the my favorite departments that we have to offer. Next slide. 
Um, so the second thing about Trinity that I hope you remember is our on-campus community. As I mentioned earlier, um, we really are all about the tight-knit campus experience. About 95% of our students choose to live on campus during their four years at Trinity. Um, we have a, res a Bantam Network residential community. Um, Bantam is our mascot. It's a little bit weird. It's a fighting rooster. Um, it's strange, but we're really proud of it. <laughs> um, uh, and the Bantam Network residential community are essentially like a housing system similar to Harry Harry Potter where every first year student is assigned to a different nest and these are just basically residential communities where you're going to have an upperclassman mentor assigned to your nest, you'll have a dean assigned to your nest, there will also be a staff member whose full employment job is to make sure that you transition well into the Trinity community um, and this was one of the many systems that we put in place to make sure that students, especially in their first year, um, feel like they have support. If you have questions about uh, mental health counseling or health and wellness or about you know how to declare your major or how to get involved in Hartford that nest is really a support system in the first year uh, we also really tried to build community through clubs and organizations as you might have seen in a previous slide we offer over 140 different clubs so that can range from like the rock climbing club or the grilling club which is exactly what it sounds they just like grill on the quad um, to more serious things like the mock trial club or the pre-veterinary society club or the Asian American Student Association and so there are many clubs so that you can kind of foster, develop um, all different sides of yourself and all of your different interests. Many of our students are involved in five or six or maybe even more different clubs. We think that part of the Trinity experience is not just about what you do in the classroom, but how you develop yourself personally and professionally outside of the classroom as well. Next slide. This is my favorite thing to talk about. I could talk about Hartford for days. As a New York City kid, I never thought I could fall in love with anywhere else. Um, and I actually fell in love with Hartford. Um, I don't want to confuse you. Hartford is not like New York City, and it's defi definitely not like the Boston that Evan talked about a little bit ago. Um, Hartford is a small city. Um, it is, in many ways, coming from New York City feels like a really big town. Um, but it is the capital city of Connecticut and has a lot of different resources for our students. Um, and aside from just community and culture, Culture. Um, there are a lot of internship opportunities that our students are taking advantage of. Um, we're actually one of a few schools that are located in Hartford colleges and so the many internship opportunities that are available are almost our students get first priority for. Um, we have over 200 internships reserved in the city of Hartford just from our students. Um, for example, we have three medical centers that are in walking distance of our campus um, and students who are interested in the health professions can take a um, fully like a full semester worth of uh, research at one of the medical centers where instead of taking classes that semester you work full-time um, with a health professional you get to say a little bit of the day-to-day -day, but you also really get a better sense of what it's like to do research and what it's like to work in the health professions we have a very similar program at the legislator where our students have actually testified on bills and helped to draft legislation so the work that you'll be able to do in Hartford is really meaningful work um, we don't think an internship is meaningful really if you're just making copies or fetching coffee. Um, Hartford is a really great place for students to really get their hands dirty and to really get to experience what it's like to be in that specific field. Thank you, Courtney. That was great. Um, so we are now going to pass it over to Craig at Binghamton. Well, hello, everybody. Again, Craig Brockley with Binghamton. Uh, some of you know this, but I'll state the obvious. Binghamton University, part of the State University of New York, or SUNY, uh, is maybe more of a familiar term. There's 64 SUNY campuses spread throughout New York. So there's 64 public university and college settings, including community colleges. Then you add in CUNY, City University of New York, which is also public. There's over 90 public colleges and universities in New York. It's a huge state population-wise and even geographically. So Binghamton is a university center. There's four university centers in the state of New York. So Binghamton is one of the big four, though we're the smallest of the big four. And along what Evan had mentioned, we are technically a mid-sized school, 14,000 students. You're never gonna run out of people to meet. It tends to feel smaller than 14,000. I'll tell you that, about that in just a moment. But it's one of those interesting sized institutions where you start to see the resources of a bigger institution come into play, but also this old heart and soul that feels a bit smaller. You know, we actually started as a small private liberal arts college, 
that had the Oxford style of living, which means you live in these little clusters or communities. They're like mini villages. That is still there at Binghamton. It's actually my favorite thing as an alum now of Binghamton. But we're a public research institution now. So we kind of grew into a different capacity. What you're looking at on the screen, since everybody wanted to talk about the cities that they're in, is Binghamton University, which is, that's our university. In the distance, before you hit those little rolling hills, there's a cluster of lights. That's the city of Binghamton. It's, if Hartford's considered a small city, Binghamton, the city, is considered a micro city. It's like 50,000 residents. It's where IBM started years ago. So it's an old, old city. But now it's really built around the university itself, though our campus is more of a suburban setting. We have a 200-acre nature preserve on campus, like a huge chunk of the wild. We are in upstate New York, three hours from New York City. Part of the reason why you would be going to a campus like Binghamton is because you want to get away from, say, an urban center. Granted, downtown Binghamton is our, our urban center. It's just part of the aspect. It's not the main reason why you're there. The, the way this works from a, a student standpoint with 14,000 students, first year through seniors, they all live in those different communities. So it's not like you're just stuck with a bunch of first year students. But we also, I want to make a point to say we have students from all over the world that show up there. As a public institution, the way we approach diversity is a little different in the sense that we can't actively strive for it, like we can't admit for diversity. But fortunately for a place like Binghamton, we had 43,000 students apply last year. Many of our students are applying from New York, particularly the Metro New York area, which is, as many of you know, one of the most diverse areas you're ever gonna see in this world. So a lot of New York City is well represented up in Binghamton. But then we have students from 100 plus countries, all 50 states, you know, given the, the year where they're coming from. We have 21 Division I teams, so we have a pretty vibrant athletic program that's, when I say vibrant, we're not good. We just care about them. We like them. We love the Bearcats. Um, 450 clubs and organizations that students partake in. That's really where you start to see the diversity come into play. If you go to that next slide, I, I want to emphasize what we are pretty good at, if we're not good at athletics, is the academic side. Particularly in, in New York, we're known as the number one public in New York. And yes, it sounds like a brag point, but mostly what this has to do with is the students that we bring in every year, by far on the, the averages, their high school averages, their, their testing scores, um, they're on the highest level for all of New York on the average standpoint. So we have bright students all around. Um, again, again, students coming in from all over. But when you talk about how the academics are offered, it falls within six different colleges. Harper College, that's what we started as, is that small private liberal arts college. That's still the core of Binghamton. The arts, the humanities, the languages, the, the social and the natural sciences, our pre-med, pre-law track. That's all centered in Harper. In fact, most of our students major within Harper. That is also where our liberal arts core is found. So no matter who you are as a student, you're gonna take courses in the liberal arts. You know, I studied mechanical engineering at Binghamton, but the main reason why I picked Binghamton, besides residential life, I thought that was really cool, um, was the Harper liberal arts core. It really gives you a sort of twist on your degree, no matter what it is. Then as you go down the line, you see some of our professional schools, the College of Community and Public Affairs, this is the people side of psychology, counseling, social work, we have a master's in sustainable communities now, a master's in human rights. There's just different aspects that could enhance more about what a standard psychology degree may have looked like. Then the Decker College of Nursing and Health Sciences, so it speaks for itself, is a nursing college, um, and a lot more branching out into the health sciences, particularly at the graduate level. The School of Management, this is probably our most selective program to get into at Binghamton. It has a strong reputation because Binghamton, the number one public in New York, New York City being the global financial hub of this world, there are a lot of deep-rooted connections into the world of business. Uh, but that is one of the many paths you could get into business through Binghamton. The Watson School of Engineering, five engineering majors plus computer science and a minor in sustainable engineering. And then our last school is our School of Pharmacy, which is a new college on campus. It's a newer uh, piece to Binghamton, a lot of research here. This actually is a graduate level program, but it has a six year track if you're really thinking about pharmaceutical sciences. And as you kind of go down the line there, there are many grad programs that you have to pick from, but in particular for somebody who's thinking about entering college, 
if you're interested in the accelerated degree paths, there's over 54 plus one programs. You get a bachelor's degree and in that fifth year you get your master's degree. If that's of interest to you, think about it, but you don't apply for that. That's something you decide once you're at Binghamton. Um, and many other kind of advisory and coaching tracks. We are an R1 research institution, so we do a whole lot of research. Uh, we just got the number one spot in the nation for sustainability research, partially because of that huge nature preserve on campus. We do a lot of research back there, but it's intertwined into a lot of areas. Dr. Stanley Whittingham, the guy on the, the right-hand part of the screen, he's our chemistry professor at Binghamton. He just won the Nobel Prize last year because he invented the lithium ion battery, which is part of all of our lives these days. But he still teaches in our first year chemistry program. If you go to the next slide, um, the, one of the more unique things about Binghamton, I know we love our research, but we're one of a handful of schools in the nation right now that has a designed first year research track. So it is for about 400 to 500 students each year start off right away on a research stream. So they work with faculty members doing research in the STEM fields, of course, but also in the humanities, that's the source project. Um, this is a very well-designed path for those of you who know you want to do research. Um, it is also well-designed for those of you who are curious about research but not sure if you should try it, particularly if you want to go on to med school or go on into further research. It's worked out well for a lot of our students. Um, we got a, a hefty grant from the NSF to run this. Uh, but the last unique thing that I want to throw towards you besides um, the fact that I, I know I mentioned our Bearcats, our athletic program, not being the highlight there, but we, we have one of the highest fan attendance in our conference, which is a small conference. It doesn't really matter much. But because we're part of the SUNY system, those 64 schools, um, we share a lot of our resources when it comes to studying abroad. So if you're interested in traveling the world, maybe not right in this moment, but at some point, um, all the 64 schools share their program where there's over a thousand study abroad programs you actually have to choose from. So it's a pretty comprehensive list to, to think about when you're thinking about traveling outside of say New York, um, if that's where you end up going to school. So try to keep pretty quick and I know you got some questions on your mind students, we'll get into that. Awesome, that was so great. I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen so that we can all have more of a conversation now. All right. So we received a lot of questions um, prior to this evening, but like I said, use that Q&A box down at the bottom. Feel free to jump in with questions and we'll certainly get to those. Um, but I want to kick it off with something that's been kind of on everyone's mind and I'm sure you've answered this question a million times throughout the spring. But if you could each just um, tell us a little bit about how COVID has impacted admissions for this fall, you know, specifically thinking about maybe testing, or any other changes to your admissions um, that you can highlight, and um, all the other updates about COVID around, um, you know, whether your institutions are planning to open this fall, as much as you know, you know that everyone is kind of in a, a different place right now and how they're thinking about this, but if you could, let's get the COVID question covered, um, and then we'll also talk about other things that are not related to COVID. So, Evan, you want to kick it off? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start us out. The question that's on everybody's mind, everybody's tongues, of course, um, uh, it, it's been very interesting for um, my office, my department, my university that I work with and represent. I'm sure that my, my colleagues can say the same. Uh, I think that um, the main challenge uh, at this point of, of the cycle is uh, balancing both uh, making sure that the fall semester and incoming students currently are all supported and secured while also looking towards uh, the future to make sure that um, folks like you, folks that might be applying in, in the future are um, accommodated as well. So um, just, to, just to double check, these are most of the folks that are joining us tonight. They'll be, are they rising seniors, not quite applying just yet? We might have a range of folks on, so it could be at any high school level. Yeah, so that's why I wanna talk about, you know, beyond just, this fall as well, gotcha. um, but yeah, I think we do have a bunch of rising seniors as well. Okay, sure. So um, that's that's very helpful. I, I can tell you that <clears throat> Northeastern we've done a couple things. Um, one uh, that is very um, trendy and buzzy, and I think personally very important is 
uh, removing the standardized testing policy from our applications process, or our admissions process, I should say, um, which is uh, something I'm very interested to see how we accommodate as an admissions staff because we have a reputation at Northeastern for better or worse, uh, that we're very test dependent. Um, we're, we're very focused on that. We're very profile sensitive, um, specifically for SAT and ACT. Uh, that's something that I've been personally sort of campaigning against. So I was very happy to see this development because we are aware that this is just absolutely rocked everybody's world, but especially uh, those, of, those of us, those of you that are still in school and making sure that their ducks are in a row for this, um, complicated and uh, cumbersome process that is applying to college. So um, because all of those steps might be disrupted and thrown out of order, um, that's no longer going to be a requirement. One thing that we are doing for incoming first years, so our seniors that just uh, graduated is, <clears throat> and we're announcing it tomorrow, so this is sort of some insider info, uh, I know, right? Um, we are sending out a academic questionnaire uh, to our incoming seniors because uh, part of the enrollment and matriculation process is sort of rubber stamping your final high school transcript, making sure that you uh, didn't have a senior spring, we'll say. And this academic questionnaire is meant to allow all of our incoming students to just express what their experience was like over the course of the last six months, year, I, we imagine that a lot of students will talk about COVID and uh, things that have occurred therein. It doesn't even necessarily have to be about that. We're leaving it a little bit open-ended because uh, we want to make sure that we're taking everything into account. Uh, even with our reputation for being very test sensitive, uh, test score sensitive, um, we at the end of the day still do have a holistic review process, which means we take every piece of a student's application into consideration when uh, driving towards a, an ultimate final decision. And uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, keeping this human aspect incorporated as well. And I'm, I'm fairly certain that we will uh, incorporate that in some fashion into our um, fall 2021 application process in some capacity. I don't know if it will be exactly the, the same admission or uh, applicate all the A words, uh, the same academic questionnaire as we're doing for our incoming first year students. Uh, but some feel that is specifically oriented towards, okay, we know that your academic experience has been disrupted and is a little bit atypical. How is that born itself out? Are there going to be pass fails? Is it just going to be um, some sort of check marks? Well, were there a couple classes that you didn't do as well as you thought you would have in? Really just keeping it wide open so that we're able to capture anything. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear what uh, my friends have to say from their schools. I can jump in. Um, I'll first share that um, currently, actually, I think about just a week ago, Trinity did announce that we do have plans to welcome our students back to campus in the fall. Um, we are kind of amending our academic calendar. So there'll be, instead of necessarily two full semesters, we'll kind of have like four sessions, two of which will, will be virtually. So it's going to be weird. It's going to be, you know, I think going day by day, figuring it out step by step, but we are optimistic that we will be able to welcome campus to the students back to campus in the fall. And, um, you know, our president has her master's in public health. So we're sure that, you know, these decisions, again, are being made at the best interest of our community. That is kind of like at the forefront for us. Um, what I will say about our admissions process is we've been test optional since 2015. So um, I think, you know, going to the holistic approach and really making sure that we're evaluating students, um, not generally, but really to understand each, each and every student's own circumstances and background and challenges has been part of our process. So we're really just going to be doubling down on that. Um, the word of the season, I think, is just going to be flexibility, um, whether that comes to deadlines or whether it comes to to um, certain requirements, we are really going to um, continue to work on a case-by-case -case basis, one-on-one -on -one with students to make sure that we're meeting their needs and kind of seeing where students are at and going from there. Um, so I don't predict that there'll be any major changes to our overall application process. It's just kind of just making sure that we're reaffirming that flexibility um, within our process. And I'll add, um as of right now, Binghamton still is going to require testing um, 
that well, this is a, a SUNY decision to be made. And I think by the end of this month or into the next month, there'll be a, a, a SUNY wide, probably even a CUNY wide decision to on what the testing policy would be. And I think if schools go test optional, it will likely for many of the schools be for one year, at least to see how that goes. Um, but, you know, I'll give advice in general because we still re require the tests, ACT or SAT, for those of students applying next year, um, if you haven't taken a test yet, it's still okay. I mean, colleges that are gonna require tests are gonna have to be flexible in how that comes into play. Also keep in mind, testing averages are based off of the aggregate of that year, right? The colleges don't start the year off saying, we want a 1450 because that's what we want. It's based off of usually previous year's information. But as applicants come through and they showcase what their testing scores are, I would make a general guess that testing averages across the nation are gonna drop a little bit because the way the access to taking these tests has changed. So don't get hung up on the numbers as much as you may have used to think numbers mattered uh, for testing. Um, obviously, other things are gonna be looked at. We know transcripts from high schools are gonna be a lot different than they've been in the past. I think common thoughts are important to keep in mind. We still look at you relative to your school. So whatever the grading policy is, that's relative to your school and that's how we're gonna review your application. So that won't change much though as my colleagues emphasize, we're gonna be looking at the other factors that have kind of changed in and around you that made you now a different student. So we're still looking for that growth as a student through high school. And we're gonna hone into those other pieces, your recommendation letter, your essay, uh, and, and just try to get a better idea of kind of where you're going in the future. For our students, we're planning this fall to have them back on campus with an altered calendar. Obviously, large, big, events are not going to be happening, but students are going to be interacting and learning together, even in a hybrid learning environment. We'll see how that goes, um, barring any crazy change of events, you know, on a public health side. Um, but we're trying to get everybody back to campus. I wouldn't say returning to normal, but learning together is more of a way we're going to do this in, in smaller, more intimate settings, maybe. Go ahead, Evan. Uh, I, I uh, in all my rambling, neglected to share what we're planning to do this fall. So thank you to my, my friends for uh, prompting that thought. Um, we uh, are definitely, uh, headline is full steam ahead for the fall, uh, but the uh, subtext is it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, as far as I understand, our academic calendar is largely going to be the same, uh, but uh, the the, the biggest change and I think the, the most critical tool in our, in our belt that we're gonna be utilizing is something that uh, is called NU Flex. And at Northeastern, we love that little new uh, prefix. We slap it on just about everything. And uh, that is going to be a learning modality, essentially where classes will be scheduled, professors will be teaching, but it will be up to both the professors and the students to decide how they want to attend that with social distancing uh, regulations all adhered to. So there may be a class being conducted in person, but the classroom has 10, 15 students socially distancing, the professor teaching, but then there is also a live stream of the class and some students will be choosing to uh, consume that in a distance capacity. That is just about the level of detail I have to share because Northeastern loves uh, building the plane as we're landing and this is an extreme test of that organizational <laughs> approach. Um, we're also coming up with uh, a, a program. So that NUFLEX is a, a modality of learning and what will really support us uh, keeping on schedule but then separately is a program largely for international students. We have just about every fifth student on Northeastern's campus coming from some other um, country outside the United States. And there is a lot of complication with visa uh, processing and just travel generally. And so NU start, another uh, handy use of our prefix, uh, our trustee prefix, is going to be a distance learning solution for our international students where uh, they are supported in a more individual way where essentially they're paired with an integration coach to bring them through their first year semester and um, some of the other courses that they're working on and some of the 
student experience things. So they're not just going to be uh, signing into Zoom, they're gonna actually be working with someone to get to know and um, engage with the community in a more meaningful way than just uh, clicking into a GoToWebinar, if that makes sense. Awesome, thanks Evan. I do have one last question for each of you. Just wanna briefly, we got a very um, specific question about dorming and how dorms will work this fall. So if any of you wanna add any comments about dorms. I know I was overemphasizing the whole residential life experience and then that is something that I think all of us, we, our students live on our campus in some capacity, right? Um, that, when we bring students back, part of it is, yes, it includes dorming. Um, usually it's you and a roommate live with, you know, live together. So it's two people that the risk association there is we deem not super high. Um, I, I think when you hear altered calendars, a lot of schools are saying, we're not allowing our students, to, well, we're highly encouraging our students once they're there to stay there, to engage with each other in smaller settings, which to be frank, that's normal, right? It's mostly you and a few friends who get together. It's not like we always are in 30 person groups. So I know that sounds like a shock to people, but the, the social distancing and togetherness norms that you'll see on college campuses are not radically different than what they always have been. Um, just maybe with some encouragement not to have big gatherings. But you'll, you'll be in, in residential settings, and I think most colleges are saving maybe a, a, a residential hall building or two to the side, you know, in case there's, you know, a need for some isolation for a, a spike in cases or something of that sort. Um, if we go through anything that we just went through, we all are pretty good at now switching to a completely online platform if need be, right? So um, I think what we're all easing into is going back to the dorm life quasi as normal, meaning that similar setting, you and friends kind of getting together, learning together, you know, eating together with, you know, keeping in mind that there's a virus that's traveling about. So being mindful of that. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that all sounds uh, very similar to conversations that we're having at Northeastern. Um, we are also very much, <laughs> we're, we're in a larger city, so a lot of our dorms go up. And so what we're trying to do is figure out where we can uh, put some students so that we can spread them out a little bit more so. Um, because with our current capacity, that it, it wouldn't work exactly the way that we would want it to. So um, we're, we're, we're uh, working we're really burning the midnight oil, figuring out um, exactly where students are going to be able to live. Um, there uh, is a hotel that's like right next to campus that is looking pretty good, but other there, there, there are a lot of creative solutions being batted around. I don't have any of those final calls, um, but all of that does sound very, very similar to what Craig was mentioning. And NU Flex that I mentioned before, a student could still choose technically to live in their dorm while socially distancing across campus and attend class through the virtual delivery format. And uh, I'll put a pin in it there while I come back via shifting sunlight. One thing I'll quickly add is um, Trinity in kind of compliance with what the state of Connecticut has given us some guidance on how to reopen college and universities. We'll be seeing dorm rooms and like um, if you live with four other people as like family units. So very similar to like quarantining at home with your family. I think it'll be very similar to what Craig mentioned of like kind of having these groups of individuals that are kind of like traveling and going throughout their college experience this year, um, like in a little cohort. So. Um, I think a lot of schools, again, are kind of trying to figure it out as we go. So there'll probably be a lot more information come September 7th. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have a question about gap years. What are your school's thoughts on kids taking a gap year given the current circumstances? And will things return to normal in fall of 2021? I hope so. <laughs> um, I think at Trinity, we have given the students, um, the incoming students, the option to request a gap year or a gap semester. Um, we actually currently haven't seen a huge increase in the request for gap year or gap semesters. We initially thought we'd see a huge spike, but um, it seems, at least for right now, knock on wood, that we haven't. Um, but I think that option will remain for future cycles, just as it always has. Um, 
it just gives students a flexibility. I think the challenge with gap year is usually students who are taking a gap year are doing an internship or planning a study away or working. Um, and that I think is up in the air this year. Students don't necessarily have as solidified plans just because things are now starting to reopen. Um, so I don't know if a gap year is as attractive for students as it might have been in the past. Yeah, Sabe, it's, it's the only thing with our gap year program, it literally is a year. So we have many students who normally do it. Granted, we're actually lower than we are in previous years. As Courtney mentioned, we're taking a gap year to do something was always the reason. Um, I'm in favor of students making a conscious decision if they're health concerned about it. But on the other side of the front, I mean, as a cohort, as we keep emphasizing for those students of next year and even the year after that, because we're probably still going to be adjusting as society, that's what college is about, uh, keeping your health in mind and making sure you're making the right decisions for you as an individual, but knowing that, hey, we're adjusting to this big change in this world together. The students who are not sitting out of the process are probably going to not only have something to talk about, but something to grow with. So we, we're seeing a lot of students who are trying to you know, ease into this fall um, as if it were a traditional fall, you know, keeping in mind that there's things that they have to do differently. Yeah, I, I agree with what both Courtney and Craig have, have said uh, about what I've seen trend-wise and just sort of the overall um, balance of, or, or, or the balance that is weighed when arriving at that sort of decision. Um, we, we don't have a deferral, a semester deferral policy. Our gap year, similar to Binghamton, is for the full academic year. And uh, students are not able to enroll in university level courses as well. That's just, that's a, that's a very important uh, sort of snag in the policy that I think is pretty standard. Um, some of the students that I've spoken with in, in my, or from my New York schools have been saying, oh, I might go to a local school if it's just going to be online. And it really, it doesn't exactly work that way, unfortunately, uh, because our institution, whatever local institution, they're all trying to plan out their sort of, their, their enrollment and, and figure out um, which, studi which students are going to be where and when. And so uh, a gap year is, is a really big decision and especially given social distancing and, and where we are just culturally, I, I would recommend thinking about what it is you would be doing during that time. If you weren't originally planning on a gap year or thinking about one seriously, I would probably recommend against it. Of course, it's a personal decision, but that's, that's my perspective on it and there was another point that I wanted to make but it is escaping me at this time so I I, I apologize for sounding a little bit like a downer uh, but that is that, that's that's um, my professional opinion on it. Excellent thanks all for sharing um, we have some questions about the science programs at your school um, so if you could tell us a little bit about the science programs I know it's a general question so take that how you want it but also um, specifically we have one question about dentistry programs and if that's offered at your school. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. I think I neglected to mention academics when I was doing my intro earlier, so I'll, I'll get some of my important points in there. Uh, Northeastern overall, we are a comprehensive university, which means we have programs across all disciplines, uh, but um, domestically within the United States, we're, we're known for our engineering program, our College of Engineering. We have uh, sort of an up and coming, uh, very quickly growing uh, Cory College of Computer Science and a more uh, catch-all College of Science. If you're interested in health science, there's a separate college for those programs as well, the Bouvet College of Health Sciences. Uh, we are known for professional development generally through co-op and engineering is really where a lot of that tradition was built over the course of the past hundred years where Northeastern was a little bit more of a commuter school where uh, folks would be working in industry, maybe in heating ventilation or, or what have you, and then coming to Northeastern at night to take classes. And so that tradition of cooperative education, learning by doing uh, was built largely through the sciences. And that's where we have a lot of our strongest relationships with employer partners um, and separate from the co-op experience, we are also known for our pre-professional advising tracks. Um, the, the largest, the, the best known is 
our pre-health advising program. We are not affiliated. Well, I should say we don't have a medical school on our campus, but we have uh, a lot of really great relationships in Boston, all throughout the United States and across the world at hospitals and medical centers that our pre-health advising students are connected with. And we call it pre-health because uh, a student that is interested in going to medical school, but also dental school or veterinarian school or um, physician's assistance program, anything like that, are uh, well supported by that uh, advising track. And students from any major can take advantage of it. Most popularly are our science students, but that's a, a quick snapshot of science at Northeastern. Awesome. I'm just going to add in, Evan, um, you did say, see, say pre-vet um, or pre-health, the veterinary sciences would fall into that. And we did have a question comment about pre-vet. So Craig and Courtney, if you want to address that question um, and add that to your, your response. Sure. Um, I'll share a little bit about Trinity because I think the way we approach our science programs might be a little bit different as a liberal arts institution. Um, unlike some other institutions where you have to apply into a specific program or school of like the sciences at Trinity, again, you just apply generally and you know, regardless if you're going into the engineering program or the biology program, um, you still have that two kind of some two, uh, two year buffer to actually declare your major. So um, our approach to science is incredible incredibly interdisciplinary. Um, the advantages to that is that you'll still have those small classroom size courses. They'll still be very much per, um, discussion based courses. So even if you're in electrical engineering course, your professors will usually typically know your name. They'll be engaging in conversations about the subject matter instead of being kind of in that large um, lecture hall. Um, but at the same length, we still have access to research um, at a very high level as early as your second year for students. So um, in many ways, in a very cheesy sense, you kind of get the best of both worlds if you're doing liberal arts science at a liberal arts school. Um, in terms of some of the programs that we offer that I think are unique, um, I think our engineering um, is probably one of our most unique programs that we offer at Trinity in general. We're probably one of maybe just 10 or so small liberal arts schools that actually has a fully accredited engineering program um, with various concentrations that students can do at the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Science level. So um, that is a really cool program. The neuroscience one I talked about, um, for students who are interested in pre-health, whether that's pre-veterinary, pre-dental, or um, going off to medical school, School, we don't necessarily have a specific major or department. Um, usually those students will major in biology or something in the health sciences, but um, we'll also be on the pre-med or pre-health track. Um, each uh, specific kind of area will have their own advisor, academic advisor, that will make sure you're taking required courses to go on to graduate school, but also that you are preparing yourself for applications, making sure that you have letter recommendations signed up, and that you're also looking for the extracurricular and professional opportunities that might exist in Hartford to help supplement those opportunities as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about the Trinity experience. I'll pass to my friend Craig. Yeah, I mean the sciences, they run deep at Binghamton, but at a university, it's, you're still going to have the comprehensive stretch to that. I will make the quick caveat, like everybody still has to take liberal arts. I don't care if you want to be a doctor and you only want to study anatomy and physiology, you still have to be taking courses outside of your major. Engineering would be a separate pathway, right, within the sciences. I, I would then add to the fact that math has now trickled into so many different degree paths. Um, I know it wasn't asked about, but like math is something that I, I tend to get overlooked, but with this like data centric mindset, business has it in there. Our, our natural sciences have a lot more involvement there. Um, of course, the engineering field, the pre professional tracks, pre med, pre dental, pre vet, they all are lumped together under a pre health umbrella. It's about 80% of our incoming class. I'm sorry, about 30% of our incoming class are under this pre-health track. Um, now, do all of them go on to med school, dental? Like, no, that's why they're at a university to kind of figure out what life is asking of them. Um, but there's a lot of students who come in with a focus on that and there's advisors to make sure you can get there. Awesome, thanks guys. All right, I think we have time for one more question this evening. Um, I have so many more, <laughs> we have to do a part two, but um, if you go test optional, if you already are test optional, will your focus be mostly on GPA, extracurriculars? How do you then evaluate your applicants? 
I guess I can go first since we're already kind of doing this. Um, for us, when we evaluate um, whether a student has submitted their scores or not, um, the transcript is where we get most of our information for the overall academic evaluation. So um, we're looking at not just the grades you're getting in the classes, but rigor. So are you taking advantage of the honors courses that might be available or the AP level courses? Um, have you um, have we're also looking at trajectory? So even if you started a little bit rocky in your first or second year, we want to see that you have have like an upward trend that you're trying to give us your best work in your junior and your senior year. Um, so most of our academic evaluation is based in on that. Um, in terms of our entire evaluation, um, we don't necessarily have like one key part that overwhelms or outpowers the other. Um, the way we approach holistic, it really gives us a better sense of who you are, not just as a student, but who you are as a person and an individual. And part of that will be what you do in the classroom, but a lot of it will also be what you do outside of the classroom, what you're involved in, um, what you're passionate about, what type of programs you might be interested in pursuing at Trinity. All of that kind of carries a pretty much an equal weight within our process. Um, and I'm assuming that many other schools, as they kind of do this trial period of test optional, will probably try to do very similar um, approach to kind of looking at all aspects um, fairly equally, but I might be speaking out of turn there. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, we want you to do well on our campus and, and academics tell us a lot about that because we don't want you not doing well, therefore you have to leave our campus. So as much as we're gonna, we can, we're gonna try to pull out academic pieces of your current situation and see where you might be in the future. With that being said, as soon as you pull out aspects, so maybe you decide, I don't want any of my scores to be shown from this last semester. Maybe your high school said, you're not gonna show that. That's okay, we're not gonna assume like you failed. We're gonna assume, all right, that's not something we can see here. We're gonna hope to see an uptick at some point your senior year or your junior year, if you're just entering your junior year now, just so we could get a better idea of where you're going. Anytime a piece is missing, like say test scores get pulled out if you're going test optional, the other pieces do tend to have more importance now. They have a magnifying glass over them because we do need to hone in on something. So just keep that in mind, right? And I'll say ditto to what Craig and Courtney had to offer. Um, I, I don't have an exact answer for all of you just yet. I, I'm, because this is something that we're rolling out for next year, I'm, I'm very excited uh, because, as I mentioned before, um, because of our uh, historic or, or historical over-dependence on standardized testing, I, I really think that this is an opportunity to focus a little bit more on FIT because Northeastern is a little bit of an atypical university experience in uh, with, with students, uh, you know, shifting in and out of class uh, into, into co-op for those six-month periods. Uh, it takes a certain sort of student that is um, focused on the big picture of their undergraduate experience um, and, and is driven to think about it in that universal sort of entrepreneurial sense. Um, so I think that this is an opportunity to, uh, of course, take a look at academically how you're doing in the classroom, but also uh, those more subjective components as well. It's something I, I really am excited to sink my teeth into, um, but I don't have the hard and fast specifics of what it will all look like, and I, I hope to influence the process. Can I just add one last piece of advice? Um, I think it's important that as you continue to navigate this process that you continue to ask that question about the test optional piece, um, just because every school will be probably approaching test optional a little bit differently. So don't assume that the way Trinity evaluates test optional is the same way that Northeastern and Binghamton will, um, especially because so many schools are kind of trying test optional for the first time. Um, I think that applies to a lot of things within the college admissions process, unfortunately, but I think the test optional piece especially will just be very different um, depending on the type of institution you're applying to. Awesome. Thank you all for that. Um, I wanted to uh, give you guys the opportunity to share your contact information if people have additional questions specifically for your schools. If you want to drop it in the chat box to all attendees, um, that way people can reach out to you. Um, and anyone's welcome to reach out to me as well. While you guys do that, I'm just going to share a little bit of information about A list. Um, I'd be remiss not to um, talk about the college advising that we offer at A-List. Um, that's me if you want to schedule a 30-minute free call, phone call with me. Um, we continue, can continue this conversation about admissions, about any questions that you have related to how COVID is impacting admissions this fall. Um, 
or you know, if you're ready to kick off your, your application process and might have questions about your essay, uh, we do it all. And we also are offering um, upcoming boot camps this summer. So we have college essay workshops, and we also have um, a common app workshop that will cover the common application and supplemental essays. And last but not least, uh, tutoring is our bread and butter. We do test prep for SAT and ACT. Um, these are some of our results. And if you have questions, you are welcome to schedule a consult with Dory. I will send all this information out in a follow-up email that will go out to you all tomorrow along with a recording. Um, so you can all review the recording if you guys um, want to rewatch anything about the particular schools um, or if you have additional questions. Uh, I'll get that recording to you. And lastly, for those who you might have had questions prior to this evening that were not answered, I'll make sure to reach out to all of you individually um, and get those questions answered for you. Um, do you guys want to say any last words before we leave this evening? Just thank you so much. This is great. I'm just going to say just make sure you stay tuned in. I know a lot of you were able to join today, but uh, Colleges are putting all, as much as we can out there digitally and virtually. Take advantage of that. I know it's hard, you know, hours are crazy and all that stuff, but try to get as much stuff as you can in this summer just to make sure you're on top of all these new changes. I was going to say the same as Craig. I think now is the time where if you couldn't get to a school in California before, now is the time where their info sessions are finally online. So take advantage of that opportunity. Reach out to counselors like us. We want to engage with students. Um, and good luck in the process. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I am just copying all those um, contact information. You guys can also find their information on their websites. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Have a good evening.